Intimidation is a favorite ploy used to frighten people into submission or surrender. Street gangs or members of the mob may utilize this tactic in order to maintain their control over others. They may not use the force which they boast. They may not even have it. But the threat of its use often accomplishes its purpose. To hold sway over persons' emotions, to dominate their actions. And the fuel on which intimidation feeds is fear. Fear causes people to make hasty decisions that are later regretted. Fear captivates. Fear distracts. Fear distorts the truth of a situation. Fear motivates men and women to act contrary to their better judgment. Fear can be an enemy. As the late Franklin Roosevelt phrased it, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Now, the opposite of fear is confidence. And confidence can be empty bravado if there's no foundation for it. But when there exists firm evidence that one's own strength and resources are a match for those who want to terrorize them, confidence can overcome intimidation. Now, as we get into the 10th chapter of the book of Joshua, we're going to find that the Israelite army was facing intimidation. The cities around them realized that by themselves they could not stand against the Israelites, and so they joined forces trying to outnumber God's people. And the Israelites had a decision to make, to be controlled by fear and the intimidation of the enemy, or to be motivated by faith. That confidence based on the power and the promises of God. And today, we as Christians have that same choice to make. And I believe that the lessons to be learned from this chapter are very pertinent for today. As the 10th chapter begins, we're introduced to several leaders who wish to frighten the Israelite army. Here we see the obstacle of faith, which is terror. In chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Now, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel, and were living near them. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than Ai, and all its men were good fighters. So Adani Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lashish, and Debir, king of Eglon, Come up now and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lashish, and Eglon, joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. Realizing that they themselves would probably be defeated one by one, the Canaanite kings band together, thinking that they could intimidate the Israelites. And that's often how intimidation works. It's the fear of being outnumbered. It's it's that fear of being overwhelmed. Intimidation whispers in your ear, the odds are against you. There's no way you can win. So this terror is the obstacle of faith. You know, one daily reality where we see this, this idea of being outnumbered, is in peer pressure. 
Peer pressure says everybody else is doing it. Come on. You don't want to be left behind. You don't, you don't want people to, to single you out and, and, and laugh at you and make fun of you. Join the crowd because everybody else is doing it. Same tactic is used by our enemy in keeping us from doing what's right. Oh, if you do that, the devil tells us, everyone's going to laugh at you. To the businessman, he says, go ahead and follow the rules and watch everybody else pass you by. Watch the other guys get the promotions while, while you follow the rules. That's how he works. To one making a stand against injustice, he says, what's one person like you going to accomplish against an entire society? This is the fear of being outnumbered, being alienated. This is intimidation, and our enemy loves to use it. We need to be reminded of the promise Jesus gave in John 16, 33. He tells his followers, in this world, you will have trouble. And that word there is literally persecution. People are going to cause trouble for you because you're my followers. Now, that statement by itself might be a little discouraging, but he didn't stop there. He said, but take heart. I have overcome the world you may feel like the whole world is against you. I've beat the world. So don't worry about it. You're not outnumbered, even if the whole world is against you. If God is on our side, we outnumber the world. And we can defeat Satan's tactic of intimidation. Now, in the context of Joshua 10, certainly the Gibeonites were feeling the intimidation. They call out in verse 6, Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. You notice what the enemies of Israel did? They did not attack Israel directly. They attacked the Gibeonites who just had made this peace treaty. We talked about that in our last study from chapter 9. They deceived the Israelites into signing a peace accord, which basically said, if we're ever attacked, you've got to come help us. Now, there might be some reasons why these Amorite kings attacked Gibeon. Maybe they were upset with them for signing a peace treaty. That could be part of it. Maybe they wanted to test the resolve of the Israelite people, find out if they're actually going to hold true to their covenant and come and help uh, the Gibeonites. Or maybe it was a ruse to get the Israelites distracted and they were going to attack them another way. We're not sure. But this was the, uh, the route that they took. Rather than coming at them straight on, they, they kind of attacked them through the side door. And if you don't think Satan works that way, <laughs> you're quite mistaken. He, he often does not attack us head on. He usually tries to come in from a side that where he thinks we're vulnerable. And that's what these kings had done. So now Joshua is faced with a choice. He can look at the odds. He can look at the numbers which on the surface are against him. I'm sure that Satan was tempting Joshua at this time saying, you don't need to defend those Gibeonites. I mean, after all, they deceived you. Remember, they lied to you. They came to you and said, oh, we've come from this far distant country and you know, look at our old clothes and, and these old moldy, moldy bread and all this stuff. You know, Sign a treaty with us. And, and Joshua didn't even bother inquiring of the Lord, quickly made the agreement, and then come to find out they're just 16 miles down the road. Oops. And Satan may have been tempting Joshua. Oh, you don't need to get involved in this. But Joshua had given his word. Now, given the way things went down in the last chapter, this might have been particularly enticing. The mistakes that we make often embarrass us, especially those mistakes that are caused by our running ahead of the Lord. And, and not following 
His will and His direction. But we need to remember that no mistake is final for the Christian. God can even use our blunders to accomplish His purposes. Someone defines success as the art of making your mistakes when nobody's looking. (laughs) But a better definition would be the art of seeing victory where other people only see defeat. Even in our errors, even when we blow it, God can still use us. And He can even use those mistakes at times. That's not saying we should go make the mistakes. But even when we do, God is still in charge. He's still in control. And He still wants to use you. Think about Peter on that first Easter weekend. I'm sure that he thought, I'm done. I've blown it. There's no hope. In the song that we watched the video earlier, even if he was alive, it would never be the same. But we know the rest of the story. We know that God wasn't finished with Peter at all. He was going to use him in amazing ways, even though he had really blown it. And so Joshua may have been tempted this to say, you know what, I, I really blew it in chapter 9, but maybe God's going to correct the problem here and wipe these Gibeonites out. Or he might have thought, you know, there's so many fighting against them. Uh, you know, may, maybe we ought to just be happy with what we have and we'll just quit fighting now. You know, just be content with what we've got. You know, that's that's temptation of a lot of churches. A lot of churches get to a point and they're like, you know, we've got a nice, happy little group here. It's a cozy group. We know everybody. You know, we don't really need to grow anymore. We don't really want to add more people. You know, it's just more people you get, the more problems you have, and you know, blah, blah. Those are all temptations of the devil trying to get us off the track. Not that every church has to be a mega church. We're not saying that. But our purpose for being on earth is to make disciples. It's not to be content with the fact that, well, I'm saved, so who cares about anybody else? Joshua's kind of facing that same situation here. And the decision he made was to trust the Lord. This is the opportunity of faith. Trusting in God. He looked beyond the external circumstances and realized that with God on our side, we are invincible. He knew the truth that you read later on in the Old Testament in 2 Kings 6. As Elisha saw the heavenly forces that were protecting him against the entire army of the Arameans. Joshua is choosing here to walk by faith, not by sight. As Paul would put it uh, in the New Testament. Warren Wiersbe writes, To walk by faith is to see earth from heaven's point of view. To walk by sight is to see heaven from earth's point of view. It's a matter of perspective. And when we're looking at things through human eyes, we even wonder what God is doing. But when we can see things from God's perspective, we understand He's got it in control. And we realize that even if we're in this alone with God, we're a majority. We outnumber everybody else. So rather than being intimidated by the enemies, Joshua and the Israelites place their trust in the word of the Lord. Look at verses 7 and 8. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. So God has given the command. Joshua has set out. I think it's indicative that it says that his best fighting men were going with him. He wasn't going to make the same mistake at AI where, you know, we only need a few few troops. 
to do the job. He wasn't saying, well, I'm not going to risk my best fighter, fighting men just for the Gibeonites. They're not even our people. No, he's bringing the best. He's bringing the whole army. And he is trusting in the Lord. Just as at the beginning of the book, when God promised his presence and his power to Joshua, so now the victory is assured to the Israelites as they obey God's commands. The victory is dependent upon obedience. Trusting God and his word is the key to victory. When the decision has to be made, faith counteracts fear and ventures forth on the promises of God. Fear always holds back. Fear is hesitant to move out because we're afraid of what might happen. But trusting in the Lord means we obey. And when the Lord says move, we move. We act in obedience to His commands. See, Christian faith is active. It doesn't just sit back and let the Lord do the work. And this active faith is displayed in verse 9. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. Now I want you to notice something here. God has promised the victory. And in the end, we're going to see that God delivers the victory. But he also expects our obedience. God could have said to Joshua, you just sit here in Gilgal and I'll take care of these guys. And he could have done it. But he didn't. He said, Joshua, you get your best fighting men, march. All night long, you go. And we're going to catch them by surprise. And so, God works through the faith and the obedience of his people. Now, you'll notice it says that uh, after that all-night march, in verses 10 and 11, the Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. You might wonder, is it Israel or is it the Lord that gained that great victory? The answer is yes. It, it is the Lord through the Israelites. Or it is the Israelites in the power of the Lord. Both are involved here. And I don't think if you take one without the other that it would have happened. It says Israel pursued them along the road from Beth Horon to Azekah. And the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky. And more of them died from the hailstones than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. And now we might wonder who's really outnumbered here. <laughs> on the surface, you might just say, oh wow, Mother Nature's against the, the, uh, the Canaanites. But, but there's a supernatural truth that might be missed just by a casual reading of the passage. One commentator writes, This phenomenon, which resembled the great hail in Egypt, was manifestly a miraculous occurrence produced by the omnipotent power of God, insomuch as that the hailstones slew the enemy and not the Israelites. If it had just been a hailstone with massive hailstones that could kill people when they hit them, it would have been indiscriminate. But only the enemy was hit by the hailstones, even though they're in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Israelites. So this is very clearly the hand of God and not just a freak of nature. And the Israelites would realize that they did not win this battle by themselves. They won it with the power of Almighty God. Now, the forces of nature continue to play a role in verses 12 through 15. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon. O moon over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped 
till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jasher. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Now, scientists and theologians have debated amongst themselves and with each other to try to explain this passage. It's uncertain whether the miracle included an increase in the sun's light so that the battle could be completed before nightfall, or whether it involved the decrease of the sun's heat so the Israelites would not be fatigued in the blazing sun. The bottom line, though, either way, you see it in verse 14. Surely the Lord is fighting for Israel. Whatever happened here, it was something miraculous. It was something God had done. And Joshua and the Israelites were able to overcome these outnumbered, outnumbering foes. They could beat the odds because of their trust in the promises of the Lord. They were determined to believe God regardless of the odds stacked against them. You know, the same opportunity is afforded to the Christian. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew 17, verse 20. Because you have so little faith, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. I know a lot of people that look at that verse and they say, you know, the mustard seed is the smallest seed there is. And if, you know, if, if a mustard seed faith can move a mountain, just imagine what a great amount of faith can do. It's not about how much faith we have. I think that was Jesus' point. You might only have this much faith and you are still unbeatable when your faith is in God. It's not the amount of faith that you have. I've often said, we don't need great men and women of faith. We don't need men and women of great faith. We need men and women with faith in a great God. That's where the power lies. And that's where the victory comes. When we put our trust in God, nothing is impossible. No situation is hopeless. We can never resign ourselves to the conclusion, I can't help it. Because in God, we can. Anything God chooses to do through us is possible when we trust in Him. But that decision is ours, just as it was for Joshua and the Israelites. We can listen to the terror of our enemy's intimidation, or we can look to the promises of the Word of God and trust Him to see us through. And whenever we choose the route of faith, you're going to see the outcome is always the same. The outcome of faith is triumph. And you see that uh, in Joshua chapter 10, beginning in verse 16. Now the five kings had fled and hidden in a cave at Makeda. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been hiding in the cave at Makeda, he said, roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. That kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? But don't stop. Pursue your enemies. Attack them from the rear and do not let them reach their cities. For the Lord your God has given them into your hand. Joshua says, don't quit until the job is done. And this is such an important lesson for the Christian soldier. We should not be satisfied until the victory is complete. Oftentimes, a soldier in God's army is defeated by an enemy that wasn't finished off in the previous battle. If the Lord gives us victory over Satan or over some particular sin in our lives, we need to make sure the victory is complete. Look down to verses 25 and 26. Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. 
Then Joshua struck and killed the kings and hung them on five trees, and they were left hanging on the trees until evening. You might say, ah, isn't that a little too much? Joshua doing a little showboating here, you know, uh, hamming it up. I don't think so. I think the display of these defeated foes was a tangible sign to the whole Israelite army that God was on their side. And that by trusting in God, they could defeat their foes regardless of how many they were. And when the Christian experiences total victory in his life, it's good to have a display of that victory. You know, I really think that's one thing baptism does for us. Baptism is an outward sign of what God is doing on the inside. And oftentimes we can reflect back to that day and say, I made my commitment to God publicly. I devoted myself to Him. Now I'm not suggesting that the act of baptism saves I'm saying that what it symbolizes saves. That faith that we put into Christ, and it helps us, it's like a a landmark that we can refer back to. I remember another time, very vivid case, when I was in Bible college. Uh, One of our fellow students was really being hammered by Satan over guilt of things in his past. And I told him, I said, I want you to to write down all these things that are plaguing you on a piece of paper. Don't worry, none of us are going to read it. It's not for anybody's view except yours. But I want you to write them down, and when you're done, put them in an envelope and seal it. And so he did that. And then we all came together, all the guys in, in our wing, we all got together. And we prayed over this brother, and I told him, take a match and light that envelope. And he watched as only he knew what was written there, but he could visually see that burn into nothing. And it was gone. He he did not have to deal with the guilt ongoing because Jesus took those sins away. But he needed that very tangible evidence. Sometimes we do. So that's why I believe God instructed Joshua to uh, show, display the victory. The outcome of faith is triumph. It always is when we put our trust in God. Now the lesson of the victory Here in chapter 10 is visualized in the armor of God when you think of the shield of faith. Paul describes it in Ephesians 6.16. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The word that is used here for shield can also be translated door. (laughs) That's because the shield of a Roman soldier back then was large, uh, usually four feet tall by two feet wide, made of wood covered with a tough leather. The edges of the shields were so constructed that an entire line of soldiers could interlock their shields and march together. It was like a wall. Uh, You even see this sometimes with law enforcement where they have the, the shields that they bring together and then they can move forward uh, protected. It's, it's like a wall that's, that's moving across uh, the battlefield. And, and I think this also suggests that we're not in the battle alone. You know, we have one another to, to uh, fight our battles with and to uh, fight alongside of. Now, what are the flaming arrows of the evil one? Well, it's all of Satan's attempts to derail us. We've talked about intimidating thoughts as one of those flaming arrows that he loves to use. He also uses lies, hateful thoughts, lustful temptations. The list goes on and on. Doubt, as we're going to see in a study later in the series. Accusations of false guilt. Oh, that's, that's a favorite 
uh, tool of the enemy, even blasphemous ideas against the Lord. Now understand that when we talk about the shield of faith, we're not talking about saving faith, we're talking about living faith. Living on the promises of the power of God. It's not simply our faith that provides the victory, it is the God on whom we place our faith that guarantees our success in the spiritual battle. Whenever we come under the attack of the enemy, we must choose to place our lives, place our trust in the Lord, and thereby we gain the triumph over Satan and his forces. John Stott writes, For faith lays hold of the promises of God in times of doubt and depression, and faith lays hold on the power of God in times of temptation. That's how we overcome by putting our trust in the promises and in the power of God. Our enemy cannot stand against the power of God. He can't. And that's why James can say, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Because he has no other course. He cannot stand against the power of God. Now as a child of God, as a member of the army of God... We will encounter many obstacles to our faith. And that will sometimes come in this way of intimidation, the the peer pressure, the, the squeeze of adverse public opinion. Right now, the, the idea of being politically correct, uh, being acceptable to the world, it's, it's pressuring a lot of people to abandon their principles, and their trust in the Lord. We may feel like we're under this kind of attack right now. And whenever we are, we're confronted with a decision. Will we allow ourselves to be terrified into submission and defeat, or will we place our trust in the promises and the power of God? To see beyond the immediate, to see the eternal. To see beyond the physical, to see the spiritual. And realize that God is always there. God is on our side. And God cannot be defeated. The question is not whether the Lord is on our side. The question is, are we on the Lord's side? And when we are on the Lord's side, there is nothing to fear. There is no doubt as to the outcome of our battle. He will win. When we choose trust, we will always win. When we choose fear, we will always lose. Every single time. There's a song in the hymnal that's probably a favorite to many. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And it is. The shield of faith is going to bring us the victory against our enemy when we decide to trust in the Lord. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, you have given to us a tremendous resource, your almighty power. The way we tap into that power is through trust. Believing in your word, trusting in your promises, and obeying your commands. And so as we are confronted by temptations to doubt, to fear, to worry, to abandon your principles, your plan, your promises to go the way of the world or our own way. I pray that we might put our trust where it belongs. Our trust in you. And that trusting in you, we will obey your commands. For when we do, we will only experience victory. Victory in Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.